Hi guys, it's Dylan from Bijou Diamond Jewelry in London again with another watch review and today we're looking at the Rolex Daytona, specifically in steel and the old reference 116520. As with all my reviews, let's skip back in time and look at the history of the Daytona. So if we travel back in time now to 1902, specifically Florida in Daytona, which is a city in Florida. Daytona in 1902 became a famous spot for people to do motor racing due to the wide, flat and very compact beaches. That makes a perfect surface for setting land speed records and doing general motor racing due to the size and flatness and length of the beach. Around that time, people used chronographs to time a driver from getting it from point A to B, so maybe a quarter mile strip or a one mile strip to calculate how uh, much their average speed was, depending on how long it took them to travel that distance or that one mile. Around that time, wristwatches implemented a special bezel called a tachymeter bezel, and that allowed the user of a chronograph watch to be able to calculate units per hour. Uh, so whether that's miles an hour, um, kilometers an hour, meters an hour, blah, 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 blah. There's loads of different uh, measurements you can make on a units per hour tachymeter. Lots of brands were making chronographs and these tachymeter chronographs, um, but Rolex didn't really make many chronographs back at that sort of time. Uh, it wasn't until a little bit later on when they actually introduced a chronograph into their classic Oyster case. Um, and that was actually 1955 and the reference 6234. And the Oyster chronograph wasn't particularly popular and that's the same story with the chronographs previous to that one. Um, Rolex never really made very many popular chronographs. And then in 1962, Rolex became the official timekeepers for the Daytona racing. To celebrate this, Rolex released the reference 6239 in 1963. Um, and it was just known as the Cosmograph. It didn't have Daytona written anywhere on the dial. In fact, it didn't actually have Daytona written anywhere on the dial until 1965. And that was a special exotic dial that Rolex released. Between that time from 1963 and 1965, when the Rolex Cosmograph became officially known as the Rolex Daytona, Rolex and other people in the industry um, and watch enthusiasts named it or nicknamed it the Daytona anyway. It's just that Rolex in 1965 actually gave it its official title, the Daytona. Now if we skip on to the late 60s uh, and meet the actor Paul Newman who was also a very successful racing driver actually owned a Daytona himself and he wore it when he raced and he actually owned a very specific dial version of the Daytona um, with contrasting subdials and a few other features and quickly that specific style of Daytona became known as the Paul Newman Daytona and now those watches go for crazy crazy money at auctions uh, they're seen as one of the most sought after Rolexes in the world. Now if we move on to 1988 Rolex released the reference 16520 and that was a complete redesign to the previous watches it had a bigger case size at 40 mil versus the old smaller size watches it also featured the first automatic movement for a Daytona and a new sapphire crystal and also it only featured screw down pushes and a few other different changes as well but this was basically uh, one of the biggest changes to the Daytona since the beginning and it's remained relatively similar to that design now. Later on they released the 116520 which is what we're looking at today and a few other models have been released since then and throughout the years it's precious metal ones, bind metal ones etc etc. One of the most notable being the 2013 Platinum Daytona which marks the 50th anniversary of the Daytona and that featured a full 950 Platinum uh, bracelet and case and also an amazing blue dial and brown Cerachrome bezel. If you haven't seen my review of that watch then go check that out as well. And then another one of the Daytonas that I reviewed was released in 2016 which is their latest version of the Daytona uh, or latest update to the Daytona and that is the reference 116500 LN uh, which features a black Cerachrome bezel and a few updates on the dial as well. Again, go check out that review if you haven't seen that already. Um, now let's move on to some of the features of this watch. Uh, this is a client's watch that has come in for a polish and service to us. Um, so excuse the scratches. So let's start with the clasp underneath. This features a Oyster Flex clasp which is super small on this watch, it's a 2004 edition this one. So this features a really nice low profile Oyster clasp. It's actually much better, uh, I think, than the newer ones um, because it's so small uh, and flat and close to the bracelet. Now if we move on to the bracelet, this bracelet is the uh, standard Oyster bracelet with the polished center links and brushed outer links. I'm not really a fan of bracelets personally. Um, I think this watch does look really nice on the bracelet, but for me, I prefer watches on a strap. I'm not a fan of super shiny watches either, and the Daytona is all polished on the case. So 
to then have a bracelet that's full of shiny links doesn't really do it for me. I prefer to have mine on the strap. Now, if we move on to the case, we've got a steel tachymeter around the edge with our units per hour and our little black inlaid numbers. Um, we've got our pushers on the right hand side of the watch uh, with our crown in the middle and these are screw down pushers. So the main feature of this watch is obviously its chronograph. Um, we've got our start stop button at two o'clock and then our reset button at four o'clock. The early Daytonas or the early Cosmographs featured just pushers without screw down or lockdowns. Um, but this watch has a water resistance of up to 100 meters and we wouldn't be able to achieve that necessarily uh, without those screw downs. So personally, I prefer pushes without the screw down locks, like on the Audemars Piguet watches. And other brands have achieved water resistance to a high level with just pushes that aren't screw down, but Rolex's approach was to make them screw down. It also does mean that they are a little bit more protected um, than if they are just normal pushes. And then on the dial, we've got white gold hands, 18 karat white gold hands and index markers. And this one being one of the older watches has actually a little bit of corrosion on the subdials, which adds like an interesting effect. The subdial at nine o'clock shows our chronograph hours. The subdial at three o'clock shows our chronograph minutes and the subdial at six o'clock shows our small seconds. So now let's look at the chronograph and tachymeter and how it applies to motor racing. Now let's imagine we're on Daytona Beach and there's a car at the other end a mile away and we're standing at the finish line. And then we get a flag to let us know a mile away that the car is set off. So let's say we see the flag go now. We'll press our start stop. The chronograph starts running. We wait a little bit of time and let's say now the car passes the finish line, stop. And that shows that the car has been doing, let's say it's a one mile strip, 180 miles an hour. So that's the average speed of the car, 180 miles an hour. And you can read that off from your second hand, your chronograph second hand, pointing at the tachymeter bezel where it says 180. And that can be used for anything, it's units per hour. So it's not limited to just miles. It could be how many bricks you can lay in an hour, um, how many boxes you can pack in an hour, it can be anything. The Steel Daytona has been one of the most popular Rolexes ever, even back in 1988 when they released the 16520 reference. Um, it was extremely hard to get hold of back then. There was several years waiting list even back then. And now it's exactly the same story. There's a long waiting list for all the steel Daytonas. Uh, they're charged at a huge premium over what their retail price is. They're regarded as one of the best investment watches you can own. Uh, you're almost guaranteed to buy one of these watches and make a little bit of money on it if you keep it for long enough. I'd say some of the best investment Rolexes are this, the Steel Daytona, either the new reference or the old reference. Personally, I prefer the old reference, um, this one that we're looking at now, uh, or the BLNR, the GMT with the Batman bezel, or the Submariner Hulk. That's also a brilliant watch for investment. Um, the Deep Blue from the Sea Dweller, the Deep Sea with a blue and black dial. Uh, that's a great watch and there's a few others from Rolex that are really good but those steel watches are the best ones to buy. Of those, the Hulk and this Steel Daytona is definitely my favourite. The white dial is probably the one I'd own for the Steel Daytona. It's completely the definition of stealth wealth um, because this watch is worth more than the bimetal ones and worth more sometimes than the white gold ones on the uh, straps. Um, it's actually almost worth as much as some of the old yellow gold ones. So it really is a stealth wealth watch and they're always going up in value. Would I own this watch? 100%. I love the Steel Daytona. I would definitely put it on the strap though. Um, I usually put my watches on Perlon straps. I think this would look great on a Perlon strap, especially the white dial because it goes with more. Uh, I would definitely own the white dial over this one, even though I do really like this dial. Let us know in the comments if you like this watch, which one would you own the white dial version of this one? Or would you own the new reference Daytona? Would you own a yellow gold Daytona, a rose gold Daytona? Let us know in the comments. Um, let us know what other watches you'd like to see. Uh, maybe some other reviews on my opinions on the market, etc, etc. Thank you for watching.